Welcome to Kingdom Come Ministries, where our leaders are Apostle William Rogers Jr. and Pastor Dr. Donna Rogers. Our prayer is that as you listen to today's message, you let the Spirit of God use the Word of God to transform your life. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for the Word of God. service on today in Jesus name now let's honor our senior leader the visionary of kingdom come ministry apostle William Rogers Jr. come on let's bless God for him. God we bless you and we thank God for you and we thank God for our virtual members amen come on let's give it up for him. you have an opportunity to be in the house at this time they don't so let's thank God for him that they're still with us, even though they're not in the brick and mortar. Oh, you can do better than that. Thank God for them. Can we put those hands together just one more time? Just one more time. Yes, bless God. We bless you. And God, we thank you. I want to make sure that I teach this lesson and teach this series with a clarity and with an understanding. Because I need you to understand we are, we are all that we have. And we need each other to do the work that God have called us to do. We need each other. Can you just look at your neighbor and tell them, I need you and you need me. And so, God, we thank you for what you're doing. I want to get into the lesson. I want to continue to talk about we will arise and build. In the book of Nehemiah, we're looking at chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 20, clause A. The old covenant, the new King James Version. The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. That is the word of the Lord. You may be seated in this place. And Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I thank you that your word will not return back to you void, but it will accomplish what you desire it to accomplish and the purpose for which you sent it. And so I want to continue to talk about we will arise and build. And so I left off last Sunday we were talking about a willingness to be willing. You, you, you have to have a willingness to do anything in life. There has to be a will to make sure that thing get accomplished. And we said our will is the faculty of the mind. It is the faculty of choice or decision by which we determine which actions we shall perform. And so we said last week also, our mindset is the foundation of all achievements. It is core to every result ever achieved. Regardless of what success we wish to create, whether in business, career, finances, relationships, health, fitness, education, or something else in your life. Our mindset is core to the results that we can achieve. Now I understand why uh, when Jesus came, the first thing he told him to do, you're going to have to repent. You're going to have to turn that thing around. You're going to have to change that mindset, that mentality, for you to receive that in which I have for you. Because our mindset create two effects on us. You should have this in your notes. If you don't, please get it. They either limit our potential 
or they liberate it. They either bring clarity or cloud our perception. Let's go back to the book of Ephesians. We're looking at chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 23. The new covenant, the amplified version. And it says, and be continually, without interruption, constantly renewed in the spirit, the core of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished, mental and spiritual attitude. You have to talk to yourself every single day. Every day you got to talk to yourself. You got to talk to yourself when you're in the kitchen cooking. You got to talk to yourself when you're in the laundry room washing. You have to talk to yourself when you're driving, going to work. You got to talk to yourself on your lunch break, at work, coming home from work. You have to talk to yourself every single day and remind yourself of the covenants of God, the promises of God, the things that God has spoken to you, the things that God has promised you. You have to constantly, daily remind yourself. I said last week, you got to speak affirmations over your life. You got to tell yourself who you are, who God says you are. You have to remind yourself of that. If not, the enemy is going to remind you of your past. And he constantly reminds people of their past to keep them from moving forward. Renewing our mind involves a lifelong process of learning. We said acquiring new knowledge or skills through experience, study or instructions, unlearning, letting go of old habits and beliefs and ideas that no longer served us, and relearning, learning something again, often a new or different way. And this is very important, and I want you to hear me with a clarity. Unlearning and relearning is just as important as learning. You got to understand that because if you don't unlearn some things, then you can't learn the new. If you don't unlearn the old, you can't learn the new. If you don't let some of that old stuff go, those old mindsets, those, those old things that were spoken into you out of ignorance, out of lack of knowledge, then you can't receive the new. Matter of fact, Jesus says it like this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You cannot put new wine in old wine skin. You cannot receive the new, what God has for you in your now season, in this season of your life, still holding on to the old of what happened, still holding on to the old of how you was raised and still holding on to the old. You know what? There are some of us in here from the old school, and, and some of you parents, please grab this and listen to this. If, if you was to ask, how many times did your mother tell you she loved you? How many times did your father tell you he loved you? Today, how many times do your parents tell you they love you? How many times do the children tell the parents? How many times do the, do the members tell the pastor? How many times do the pastor tell the members? Now, hear me now. Sometimes, even though our parents did not tell us verbally that they loved us, we knew they did because they took care of us. And they provide it for us. Pastor, why are you saying that? Because the enemy, he, he wants you to grow up and he wants you to develop. Uh, and, and that's okay. He, he's not going to stop you from doing that. But what he don't want you to do is he don't want that mind. He don't want that mind to grow and that mind to develop. And instead of you embracing who you are in life and everything that God have done for you and everything your parents have done for you to the best of their abilities... Hello? He wants you to start complaining, talking about I need a therapist because when I was growing up, this happened and that happened and that. And some things may have, but how long are you going to stay there? Because you cannot put new wine in that old wine skin and you still wounded. There's still unforgiveness. You still broken. You still angry, mad as hell, and don't want to take it back. So this is what Jesus said. We can't put new wine in old wine skins. Jesus used the analogy because here he came with a new teaching. And Jesus came with the teaching of grace. And he came to heal the people and make them whole and, and, and make sure, you know, all areas of their life was sufficient. 
but they were still holding on to the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were still holding on to that teaching of religion. And Jesus was like, you will never walk in your freedom. You will never be healed. You will never be whole. You will never be able to walk free if you're still holding on to the past. Do we understand that? To that old wine. The old ways of thinking and living were like old wineskins that could not contain the new teaching. And so now we're coming to the knowledge that renewing our mind is a continual journey of growth and transformation because now as the mind understands the truth of God's word, it gradually transformed by the spirit of God and it renews and lead us to a changed life. You gotta understand this, physically we are what we eat. That's why you the size you are because physically we are what we eat but spiritually we are what we think. And so the Bible says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so we've been talking about getting that mind renewed because it's very vital and it's very important. We renew our minds because it enables us to stand firm against the lies of the enemy. Please go with me. We're going back to Ephesians chapter 6. We're looking at verses 11 through verse 12, the new covenant, the new King James Version. And the word of the Lord tells us, put on the whole armor of God. We talked about this last week. What is that armor, Pastor? It deals with truth and righteousness. It deals with peace and faith, salvation, the word of God and prayer. Put on the whole armor of God. Dress yourself every single day that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes and the tricks and the traps and the snares of the devil. Verse 12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We cannot continually use our energy to fight each other. I am not the one you're supposed to be fighting against. I am not your enemy. Yeah, there may be some things you don't like about me, but I ain't your enemy. Are you hearing me? The Bible says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So now we can't be ignorant of Satan devices. If we bite and devour each other, we're going to be consumed. You have to understand that. And so we were talking about how the Babylonian captivity had took place and it was very traumatic for, for the Jewish people. It was very traumatic for the Israelites. The Babylonian king, he came in, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he attacked Jerusalem and, and destroyed the city. He destroyed the walls on every side. He destroyed the lifestyle. He destroyed the culture. He destroyed the values. And even the temple was destroyed. And then he took those people away. Anytime you're caught up in bondages and fetters and chains and you're captivated by things in your life, you need the word of God. You need the power of God to break those things off of your life. Are you hearing me? A lot of times there's generational curses. Your mother had it. Now you have it. Now your children have it. Matter of fact, let's go back. Your great-grandmother had it. And then it goes back. A lot of times when you see these generational curses, they can be broken off your life. I need you to understand that. You don't have to wrestle. You don't have to struggle all the days of your life and look at mama went through this and, and daddy went through this and, and daddy was sick with high blood pressure and, and this one had this and, and mama didn't have this and mama was always in and out of psychiatric wards and different things was happening in their life and we were always broken and we never had anything. You don't have to continue to sit, look at your life, reminisce over your life and say how you was. Now you got to speak into yourself how you shall be because of the word of God. Who am I talking to? Uh, not another day of your life do you have to be live in poverty or be broke or be discouraged or be frustrated or be angry or be mad, living unforgiveness, tossing and turning, all of that. Not another day in your life. I'm talking to you today. Somebody say not another day. You don't have to live like that. That's your choice. But pastor, you don't know what I'm dealing with. I don't have to know, but God knows. 
And he came just for you. He came to heal you, to heal up those broken areas in your life. He came to make you whole in every area of your life. You don't have to be frustrated. I'm telling you. The main, the main thing that I constantly hear, the main thing I'm constantly hearing in this season is how I was treated when I was young and what happened to me and, and what this. And my question is, how long you're going to stay there? How long are you going to stay there? You have to understand that's the objective of the enemy, to constantly beat you up and batter you in your mind. Well, Pastor, if I could do it all over again, I think we all can say that. Hello? I think we all can say, boy, if I knew then what I know. Hello? Hello. I think we all can say that. I would have done that a better way. I would have said this a better way. I, I wouldn't have married that when I, would, I wouldn't have had that many children. I, I wouldn't have did this. I think we all can say that. But that's the past. What are you saying about your now? Okay. You, 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 you have to understand because that's the objective of the enemy. To constantly beat you up and batter you and get you caught up in something. It was 70 years that the Babylonians, you know, they came in and they took the Jews. 70 years they was in captivity. 70 years they had to live there. 70 years they had to see things. 70 years they had to express and deal with things that they didn't want to go through in their lives. And even though they came out of that captivity, guess what had them bound? The, that mindset. Even though you're still accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, some of you are still bound that mindset. You're still bound. The enemy pulls up how people treated you and, and pulls up different experiences you had in your life and pull up things when you least expect it. And it keeps you bound. In your mind, you don't want to move forward. Why? Because, Pastor, this person hurt me. Everybody ain't that person. Are you hearing me? I see a lot of you sitting in here today. I don't know where you come from, but you can't look at me as a pastor from where you came because I'm not that pastor. Are you hearing me? That's not who I am. And so I'm here to help you and to cause you to grow and to cause you to develop and to cause you to move forward and to speak affirmations into you and cause you to be healed and cause you to be whole, but you still stuck. Well, Pastor, I'm here, but Pastor, I don't want to do anything because of how I was treated or where I come from. Will you please let that go? Hello? I know I'm talking to you in this place in the own street. Will you please let that go? Our past may explain some suffering in our lives, but we must not use it as an excuse to stay in bondage. Just to stay in bondage. We, we can't use our past as an excuse. Please go with me to 2 Corinthians. We're looking at chapter 10, and we're looking at verses 4 through verse 5, the New Covenant, the Amplified Version, as we continue to lay the foundation for this series. And the word says, the weapons of our warfare are not physical, weapons of flesh and blood. There it go again. We're not fighting each other. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortress, strongholds, mental walls of resistance in the mind, which has become our belief system, our lifestyle of functioning, and our doctrine of belief. Those, those thoughts that have been in your mind for so long, you done heard that stuff generation after generation after generation. Now it has become your lifestyle, your functioning, and your doctrine of belief. You believe. You have to be poor. You believe you have to be broke. You believe you have to stay in the situation that you're in. You believe that because those thoughts have took you captive in your mind, and now they have become a lifestyle, a doctrine of belief. You believe you can't be healed. You believe God don't love you. You believe there's people that don't love you. Those, those doctrines, those, those thoughts, they become lifestyles entrenched in your mind, and now you're looking at everybody else crazy because you you don't believe God is real. You don't believe that he still heals. You don't believe that he will still come in and make you whole because that mindset. Are you hearing me? 
that mindset. Some of you have been through traumatic things in your life. Some of you have been abused in marriages. You don't even want to be married again because you think the next person is going to abuse you. That's the type of stuff I'm saying. You got to pull that. You'll never be happy. You got to pull all of that stuff down. Are you hearing me? And so he says here in verse 5, we are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, we're going somewhere. Just let me, let me lay this for this series. Taking our thoughts captive means choosing what we allow to take root in our mind. Now, you have a choice. Why you say that, Pastor? Because we can't rise above our mentality. You trying to go somewhere and you trying to build, but you can't go no further than how you think. And so here, they went back into a demolished city. There was no economic structure. There was no job. There was no government. No leadership. There was no direction. And worst of all, it seemed like there was no hope. Please go with me to Nehemiah. We're looking at chapter 1. We're reading verses 1 through verse 3, the Old Covenant, the NASB version. And so it says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Halkola. Now it happened in the month of Chivla, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them about the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. Now, I need you to understand history, and I need you to understand something here because in many ways, Nehemiah, he had it made. He was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah, he had a position that afforded him a home in the palace. He was close to the king. He had a life of luxury compared to most of his Jewish counterparts. He served the king his wine, and he was the one that tasted it to make sure it wasn't poisoned before the king drunk it. It could have been very easy for Nehemiah to be so wrapped up in the comforts and pleasures of his own life that he didn't have time once he heard what was happening in Jerusalem and what was happening to the people. Now, you got to understand, how many people come to you with problems or how many people come to you and say certain things and you just brush it off like it's nothing? Nehemiah was set. He didn't have no problem. There was no trouble going on in his life. He was set. Nevertheless, Nehemiah makes it clear that the comforts of Babylon were not enough to overrule his concern for the things of God and his people. Please hear me now. What I want to know, and, and, and when I read this, I'd be like, okay, God, now help me with this. Help me. How is it that his brother came and told him about the condition of Jerusalem, him and his friends, but his brothers and his friends hadn't done nothing about the condition. How is that? How is that that you see the church need help? How is it that you can see your life need help? How is it that you can see your family need help? How is it that you can see there are sinners out there that need help and you go and tell somebody else about it, but you ain't doing nothing about it? Hello? So when I read that, I was like, wait a minute, back that up, hold on. Because the day and time we live in can be described as an age of apathy. It is rare that anyone is truly concerned with anything beyond themselves and their lives. That's the day and time we live in. Are you hearing me? That's the reason why Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it's going to be in the days before the Son of Man come back. You will come to a worship center, but you ain't concerned about it. You will come to church and listen to the music and listen to the singing and listen to the preaching, but you ain't concerned. The day and time we live in, we don't have compassion and concern for people no more. If it's not about us and our house and our three and what's going on this and my last name ain't known it, we don't care. We don't care. Apathy is a lack of interest enthusiasm or concern. It means I don't care. 
is not the same as ignorance. I don't know is not the same as complacency. I am satisfied with my current status. Or is not the same as laziness. I don't feel like doing anything. It means I don't care. It means I don't care. After the benediction and when the service is over, I don't care. I'm not going to stop and speak to nobody. I'm not going to stop and love on nobody. I'm going to take my stuff, whatever it is, and I'm out of here racing to get to the park a lot, and you really can't go nowhere because you're blocked in. <laughs> but it's I don't care. I don't care if I never get to know the people that I worship with. I don't care if I never embrace the people that I worship with. I don't care if I never encourage the people that I worship with. I don't care if they don't ever know my name, know who I am. I don't care if it's new people that's coming to the house. I don't care if they feel welcome or not. I don't care because I'm just concerned about me. Thank you for listening. But the word of the Lord says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him is sin. And so verse 3 of Nehemiah goes on and says, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and, and, and disgrace and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. So my thing is, how many people knew about Jerusalem? How many people knew that the walls were burnt down? How many people knew about the gates? How many people knew about the people were sitting there distressed? How many people knew that and didn't do nothing about it? What are the things that you know about and you don't do nothing about? What are the things that you see and you do nothing about? Nehemiah had a burden, and it didn't stem from just hearing about the needs of the people, but it stemmed from feeling the needs of the people. See, you, you have to now be able to feel hurting humanity. you got to be able to feel the people that's hurting. you got to be able to feel the needs of the people, not just hear about it. you got to be able to feel where people are hurting at. Are you hearing me? Because when God gives us a burden, he placed on our heart a compassion. We feel an unselfish, deep concern for the Lord's will and for the interests of others. Sometimes you may be on your way home and, and God will put something in your heart and he'll tell you, you go visit that person or, or you put this in that person's hand or you take that person out to eat or you go buy that person some groceries or you do this. What is it? What Just, just what is it that, that God had put in your heart for your ministry? Hello? What burden do you have for your ministry? What burden do you have for your home? What burden do you have for your family? Please go with me to the gospel according to St. Matthews. And we're looking at chapter 9, and we're looking at verse 35 through verse 36. The new covenant, the NASB. And it says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. And it says, seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them. He didn't just see the need, he felt the need because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. And so Nehemiah was a man who became consumed with a burden. Again, let me ask you, what burden do you have? What have God spoken in your heart? What burden do you have? Because to build, you're going to have to feel something. Because you don't feel, you ain't going to be able to build. We have to understand this. In Nehemiah's example, we are reminded that whenever God uses a person to accomplish his work, it all begins with a burden. We will never lighten the load unless we feel the burden. Pastor, what is it that we need? How much money do we need? Pastor, what is it that we need? Who do you need to go to the hospital? Pastor, what is it that you need? Who do you need to gather the, the, the troops so we can do what we have to do? Pastor, what is it? I want 
you to hear me with a clarity. Matter of fact, this week, I want you to pray and ask God, God, what is it that you put on my heart? What is the burden that you've given me for my ministry? Now, individually, you can do it for your family and all of that. But corporately, if you're in this place up under the sound of my voice, I want you to ask God. I'm talking to you by way of stream. If you're out there, I want you to ask God, what is the burden that you've given me for kingdom come ministry? How do you want me to help them? What is it that you want me to do? How do you want me to help? them bill I'm talking to you God what is the burden that you want me to carry see because when it comes to building we all have to take a part of this maybe you didn't know this but did you not know you can help build uh, by, by going on and joining the YouTube you can help build by, by you all you gotta do is use your fingers get the likes up you can help build you know by going to TikTok we have Facebook pages you can help build by going on Zooms on, on Wednesday night you can help build in Saturday intercessory prayer Pastor Jess how can I help Bill, I want to make sure that Kingdom Come Ministry is moving forward and I'm one of the ones helping to build. Just how can I help Bill? You can help lift the burden. How? You can make sure that you like them. Oh my goodness, I don't know all of the technologies of all that stuff, but you can make sure. You can make sure. Well, Pastor, I can't do much. Your finger can't click. Your finger can't like. Hello? Your finger can't subscribe. Your finger can't share. That, that don't cost no money. When, 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 when you're talking about building, my, my thing is what do you have a burden for? I mean, what? Well, you know, I, Pastor, I don't like that. Okay, well, what do you like? Just what do you have a burden for? Nehemiah's burden was what God was concerned about, and God was able to act through Nehemiah because of this. And today when we think about burdens, you know, we go and put on my robe and run down by the riverside. And we want to lay our burden down and study war no more. That's not the burden God was talking about right there. Now, when you have a burden for something, it's heavy. You carry this. Are you hearing me? You carry this. It's not always easy. Please go with me to Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. It says, now when I heard these words, when Nehemiah heard about the condition of the people and the city, he says, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. What is it that you're praying about? What is your intercession about? Are you praying just to be heard? Or are you interceding? See, I think we forgot what the prayer of intercession is all about. The prayer of intercession is interceding for hurting humanity and interceding for mankind and interceding for our loved ones that's lost. Uh, we done took intercessory prayer to a whole nother place. What are you interceding for in your prayer time? Nehemiah was so bothered about what he heard. You mean my brothers and my sisters and my parents? They, they, they there, they back in Jerusalem. But there's no jobs. There's, there's, there's no e e economy system working. There's no leader there. The things, the, the walls is down. There's, there's no protection there. And you comfortable with that? You comfortable with people in your family still being bound by the enemy? You are comfortable with that? You're comfortable that the enemy have a stronghold on your family, generational curse. You're comfortable with that? Well, Pastor, it's just me, myself, and I, and I'm good, and I feel good. It's a, you're comfortable with the enemy coming in and raping your loved ones of their identity, you're comfortable with the enemy having access into your life, into your finances, into your money, and you don't think intercessory prayer is important for you? 
You're comfortable to still be in the condition that you're in. You're comfortable that you've been here 10, 15, 20 years, and there hasn't been no change in your finances, in your mindset, in your spirit, in your heart. You're comfortable with that? You're so comfortable, you don't even have time to intercede and pray. Nehemiah was bothered. He was bothered when he saw the condition of the people. He was bothered when he saw the condition of the city. He was bothered. And so what did he do? He sat down and wept and began to mourn for days, fasting and praying. That's why I say I feel a fast coming on, because we're going to get to fasting and praying up in this place. Are you hearing me? He was bothered. He, he was bothered. Enough is enough. This situation here is going to have to change. My finances is going to have to change. My heart is going to have to change. The way I see things, my perception is going to have to change. Enough is enough. I done clapped about it. I done spin around about it. Now I'm going to have to go down and sackcloth and ashes. I'm going to have to start praying and I'm going to have to start fasting because I need some things to change. If I'm talking to you and you know you need things to break in your life, you need to give God praise in this place. I need this thing to break. Enough is enough. I need this thing to shatter. Enough is enough. I need this thing to let me go. Enough is enough. I need to walk up out of this. Enough is enough. Who am I talking to? You, you, you. I mean, you, you, you done got too comfortable in Zion. What's the matter? You don't pray like you used to pray. You don't seek the face of God like you used to seek the face of God. You don't have a compassion and a hunger and a thirst and a desire after God no more. When you ask your neighbor, what's the matter? It's done happened. What have your compassion with? You, you, you have to understand now. He was bothered. It's like the people don't love God anymore. They don't have a desire after God anymore. And even though Nehemiah was okay, you know, even though, you know, where he was living at, his surroundings and his situation and his career and his lifestyle was okay, he was bothered because God's people and the work of God wasn't. So he couldn't just sit there. He just couldn't sit there and see things happen. You have to get back to fasting and praying and believing God so things can move forward in your life. Fasting and prayer are spiritual disciplines. And anytime something is a discipline, it's going to kind of be hard the first time. You know, you know how it is. Exercising is kind of hard for some of y'all <laughs> because it ain't became a discipline yet. You just do it every now and then. Uh-huh. But spiritual disciplines are practices or habits that help deepen our faith and build spiritual strength. Prayer is a way of communicating with God. That's how we communicate with God. Well, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. You pray to God just like I'm standing up here talking to you. It's communication. You talk to him and he'll talk back to you. And conversation with God leads to an encounter with God. And fasting is a sacrifice born out of expectancy. Fasting is a key to restoration. And Nehemiah knew if I'm going to get this city built back up, if I'm going to get things to happen in this city, if I'm going to get these people built back up, we're going to have to go to fasting and praying because it causes restoration. There's many of you sitting here listening to me in the brick and mortar, and there's many of you listening to me by way of stream. You need restoration in your life. Your families need to be restored. Your finances need to be restored. Your relationships, your health, and your walk with the Lord needs to be restored. Are you hearing me? And fasting is a part of that restoration. You need to be built back up. You need to be made whole again because the enemy have come into your life and he have captivated you in areas of your life to make you feel like you can't move forward in your life. Fasting, what it does is closes the breaches, the gaps in the wall that give the enemy an interest point into our lives. And when the breaches are closed, the enemy no longer has an opening to attack. 
And so now we need to close up all of that. Somebody said, because we got work to do. Please go with me to Isaiah. I'm looking at chapter 58, and we're looking at verse 12, the old covenant, the NIV version. And the word of the Lord says, your people, those from among you, will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairers of broken walls, restorers of streets with dwellings. And that's what fasting do. It causes us to restore. It causes us to build up. It causes us to raise things up that have been broken down in our life. There's a lot of stuff that's broken in your life. This may seem comical, but I, I think it'll help you understand it. You know how you live in a home and little by little things begin to break, the lock on the back door break, and you just put tape on it and say, oh, I get that fixed. Or something break in your car, you know, maybe the sun visor break and you driving and it's constantly going up and down, up and down, and you say, oh, you just tape it up. And that's how we do in our spiritual life. Things get broke instead of we fix it. We just tape it up and say, well, I get to that later. I get to that. No, there are areas in all of our lives that need to be rebuilt. Amen? Amen. They need to be restored. They need to be fixed. And now is the time to get it done. Are you hearing me? The Bible allows us to know we are the repairs of the breach that stands in the gap, interceding and repelling the enemy. It's going to take each one of us individually and collectively now to begin to repair some things. Stop just letting them things go in your life. Notice and see what you see and then do something about it. That needs to be fixed. Make sure you take the time and fix that. Just don't put that off. My, my finances, my credit score need to be fixed. Make sure you take the time and fix that. Are you hearing me? My heart needs to be fixed. Make sure you take the time and fix that. Who am I talking to? Because I'm going to talk to you. There's things need to be fixed. We're too busy trying to do other stuff, and we haven't taken the time to fix certain things. You got to get that heart fixed. Are you hearing me? The Bible says to the pure, you say it, all things. You got to take the time and get that heart fixed. You got to take the time and get things fixed in your life. Because now we are the repairers of the breach. Whatever has been destroyed, we will rebuild. And whatever has been broken, we will repair. And whatever has been lost, we will restore. This is the season we're in, and this is what we come to do. I want you to think in your life. That's right. Take the time. Think. Think. Things that need to be repaired in your life, things that's broken, things that needs to be fixed. Come on now. There's things we got to unlearn. Th think about those things. I'm going to have to fix this. How do I fix that, Pastor? Unlearn it. I'm going to have to fix this. How do I fix this, Pastor? I'm going to have to relearn how to do it the right way, how to say it the right way. Nehemiah teaches us about leadership and teamwork and relationship with others. This is what he teaches us about. To build, we build as a team. As a team. People are watching you. And we're leaders. And you know the leaders go first. We always the ones on the front line. And people are watching us. They're watching the way we dress. They're watching the way we talk. They're watching the way we respond. They watch the way we behave and the way we act. They watch the way we love, the way we touch people, the way we reach out to people. We are the leaders on the front line. We're the ones go help people repair their homes and repair their marriages and repair their lives. We are the ones that's going to help people repair their credit score. We are the ones that's going to help people become healed in their mind. We are the ones that's going to help people become whole. Are you hearing me? And so we have to understand this. The state of Jerusalem's wall reflected the condition of the Jewish people's lives. So before Nehemiah could do anything about rebuilding the brokenness inside the city, he had to fix the brokenness inside the lives and the hearts of the people. I want you to know that you have a pastor that loves you so dearly that I don't want you to ever come to this house needing help, need to be healed and whole, and you don't receive that. Are you hearing me? 
You don't have to sit through a whole service and be broken and wounded. We have deacons here. We have elders here. We have youth pastors here. We have system pastors here. We have people here that can help you become healed and whole in your life and the church say. Amen. No, you, you, you don't come in here and then leave out the same way. Nehemiah cared enough to pray. Can I ask you a question? Who are you praying for besides yourself? Who are you interceding for besides yourself? Who are you taking the time out to make sure they become restored and healed besides yourself? Who are you taking home with you to make sure that their bellies is full besides yourself? Don't go ghost on me now. There are areas that we must build up. He cared enough to pray for God's will to be done on earth. He needed people to be available for him to use. God needs you. Thank you for listening to me today. God needs you. And God wants to use you to make sure his will is done in the earth. To make sure we're constantly building. Please go with me to Nehemiah chapter 1. I'm looking at verses 5 through verses 11. I think I have one, two more scriptures and I'm done. The old covenant. The message version. The prayer begins with praise to God. Now Nehemiah see the condition. And he knows something has to be done about the condition. And he was so hurt that he began to pray. You know how it is when you meet people and they start telling you things about their lives and, and you see that there is conditions and stuff. They don't need you to talk about them or gossip about them. They need you to pray. Hello? So it says here in verses 5 through verses 6 of Nehemiah chapter 1, the message version, I said, God, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, loyal to his covenant and faithful to those who love him and obey his commands, Look at me, listen to me, pay attention to this prayer of your servant that I am praying day and night in intercession for your servant. The people of Israel confessing the sins of the people of Israel, and I'm including myself, I and my ancestors among those who have sinned against you. In other words, Nehemiah begins to pray, and he's talking to God like God. Now, we, we, we have a situation here. We have a crisis here. There's a problem here. And before I begin to do anything, I want to make sure that line of communication is open. I want to make sure I'm in alignment with you so we can get done what we need to get done. Amen? Amen. We want to make sure that we are in alignment with the word of God so we can arise and build. Nehemiah confesses sin, intercedes on behalf of the people, and he recounts God's promises. Look at verses 7 through verse 9. He says, we treated you like dirt. This is what he's telling God. We haven't done what you told us, haven't followed your commands, and haven't respected the decisions you gave to Moses, your servant. All the same, remember the warning you posted to your servant Moses. If you betray me, I'll scatter you to the four winds. But if you come back to me and do what I tell you, I'll gather up all these scattered people from wherever they ended up and put them back in the place I chose to mark with my name. And then Nehemiah expresses his confidence in God, and then he asks for favor. Verses 10 through verses 11. He says, well, there they are. Well, there they are, your servants. Your people whom you so powerfully and impressively redeemed. Oh, master, listen to me. Listen to your servant's prayer. And yes, to all your servants who delight in honoring you. And make me successful today so that I get what I want from the king. I was cupbearer to the king. In other words, now Nehemiah cared enough to volunteer to go to Jerusalem. He didn't pray to God and ask God, God, can you send somebody else? Um somebody's in the hospital sick. Pastor, can you send somebody else? Why can't you go? He didn't ask God to send somebody else, nor did he argue, I'm ill-equipped for the job to get the job done. He told God, here I am. Whatever you need done, 
whatever burden you want me to carry, whatever it is you want me to do, I care enough to get the job done. Now, I want to ask you that question. How, how many of you care enough to get the job done? Now, I want, I, I, want, I want you to listen now. How many of you care enough to get the job done? You got another job this week. I want you to make sure you get to me. If you have to get it to me by way, you know, of uh, 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 Pastor Sheikah, you have to get it to me by way of the deacons or the elders or whatever, however you want to get it to me. I want you to make sure you get to me and say, Pastor, this is what I'm concerned about when it comes to our ministry. I don't want no negative foolishness. But, Pastor, this is what I have a concern for when it comes to our church. I want you to write down your concerns about this house. I'm talking to our virtual members as well. And I want you to filter them through that administrative office so I can read them and see and begin to pray over them. What are you concerned about? You have to be concerned about more than just you. Amen? Amen. You have to be concerned about more than just you and your family. Amen? Amen? There are other people we are in this faith community with, and they need us. Did you not know you encourage the next person when they see you? So Nehemiah expresses his confidence in God and asks for favor. And Nehemiah cared enough to volunteer to go to Jerusalem. Now let me tell you something about the patriarchs in the Bible. Abraham cared and rescued Lot from Sodom. Moses cared and delivered the Israelites from Egypt. David cared for and brought the nation and the kingdom back to the Lord. Esther cared and risked her life to save her nation from genocide. Paul cared and took the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. Jesus cared and died on the cross for a lost world. What do you care about? What is it that you care about? What compassion do you have in your heart? What do you feel about the people of God and the things of God? Because God is still looking for people who care. And before Nehemiah turned to the king of Persia, he turned to God. Please go with me to Nehemiah chapter 2. And we're looking at verses 2 through verse 3. And we're looking at verse 12. This is my last scripture. Good teaching, amen? amen. The old covenant, the NIV version. You got to care about something. You have to have an, a, a compassion about something. Each one of you that's under the sound of my voice that's a part of Kingdom Come Ministry, that you have made it your family, you have made it your home, you need to be taking part in something. It says here in verse 2, so the king asked me, because Nehemiah was so burdened, his heart was so heavy, says, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The burden that Nehemiah had, it dwarfed every other care and concern in his life. He's standing there by the king. He's right there. He's the cupbearer. He got everything in life he asked for, everything in life he wanted, but his heart is still burning, and he still have a concern and a compassion there. Why? Because of the things of God. See, sometimes we get caught up in our careers, and we get caught up in our own life, and we forget about the call of God on our life and the burden that God has given us. Are you still here? But God was the one that put that burden in Nehemiah's heart. Because Nehemiah had the opportunity and the capability of doing the very thing which God had called him to do. Verse 12 says, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on, in other words, the horses. And again, I would ask you, what has God put in your heart? I want you to think about this. I want you to think about what is it that God has put in your heart? What compassion do you have for the church? 
And you may think it's small, and you may think it's real minute, and you may think it's real simple. But that's the objective of the enemy to stop you from doing what God have anointed you to do and from building. Are you hearing me? I mean, what is it that you like doing? Well, pastor, I like exercising. Well, can you get us an exercise class going? Because we all can use that. Amen. Are you hearing me? Oh, I'm going to talk to you. What is God speaking to you about? Because the enemy want to make you feel you useless and you worthless and your life is over and there's nothing that you can do. I need you to know God have need of you. He have youth of your abilities and your skills and your talents. If a burden from God is genuine, somehow and somewhere the capability and the opportunity to fulfill that burden will become a reality. Those with the burden see not only the problem, but the role they play in the solution. We will arise and build. We thank God for that word. Now it's time to show our gratitude to God through giving. The word of God reminds us in 2 Corinthians 9 and 6 that the one who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So we prepare for our generous crop as we sow our financial seeds in faith today. To all of our virtual members, we are so glad to have you as a part of KCM and we want to get to know you more. Would you please send us your contact information to KCMTampaFL at gmail.com so that we can stay connected. We look forward to meeting you real soon.